Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Dom Famularo, drumming's global ambassador. And that title was given to him by Ron Spagnardi, the uh, founder of Modern Drummer, which I just found out, and that is beyond <laughs> cool. So, Dom, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bart. Thanks so much. You know, it's kind of interesting when I hear that title. I remember Ron Spagnardi and back in 1977 when the magazine first came out. I knew Ron because he was a fantastic drummer in the in the New Jersey area. I live here on Long Island and in the New York area. And we get together at a certain uh, gigs together and we talk about the idea that he had as far as putting a, a magazine together. And then as his career went into the magazine career and my career went on doing different events and performances globally, as we met up several years later on, he kind of said, he said, you know, Dom, you really are, are traveling the world, spreading the gospel of drums. You really are like a, an ambassador. You now have become drumming's global ambassador. And yeah. I got a kick out of that. And in one of the uh, interviews, that kind of stuck, and people started calling me that, and I'm humbled by it. I really am. I mean, it's, it's really true. And now I feel like most people, um, they digitally get to know people via social media. And personally, I feel like I've watched a lot of your videos. You're just, you're really spreading the the love of drums, not even like, obviously you're teaching things and all that great stuff, but it's really just the, just the passion. It just oozes out of you for drums. So I think that's, uh, you, we, we all owe you a, a huge thank you for, for getting the next generation excited about drumming. Thanks, Bart. You know, I think what's amazing about it is that when someone follows their passion, and you got to really understand what that means. I, I, it doesn't matter whether your passion is knitting or fishing. When you have a passion that you are so driven by, and then you, you see people that are older than you that have that passion, and that's really kind of where the guiding point came from. I met many senior statesmen in the drumming field, all these great, great legendary names, and I met them at a young age. And when I saw them having great fun and living their passion, I just said that, that that's what I want to do. That, that's, yeah. this, it really was, was driven. So it was really all these great... Uh, fantastic drummers that we stand on their shoulders that really have guided us along the way. That's so true. And I just love how it's, it's not something where it's just for kids or something like that. You know what I mean? Like we're all, I mean, just being an adult, it's like it, it you meet guys who are 90 years old who, I mean, Roy Haynes just turned 95 recently and it's, you, you never grow out of it. And he's the biggest kid of all of us. <laughs> Jim Chapin yeah. used to say to me, the object is to act childlike and not childish. Very true. And Roy Very Haynes, true. when I hear him play and when I speak to him, he is still childlike with the passion of performing and playing drums. And it's just really incredibly inspiring. So jumping off of Roy Haynes, who is an absolute legend in the in the drum world, we're talking about some legends today. Um, so these guys, and, and as you put, as we talked before, they're the technique legends. So we're talking about Billy Gladstone, George L. Stone, and Sanford Moeller. And uh, I just, I really love how you said these guys taught the legends who we all love. They're the reason we have the greats. They really did. And what's amazing about it, Bart, is that these gentlemen, first of all, all three of them, Gladstone, Billy Gladstone, George Lawrence Stone, and Sanford Muller, were born in the 1880s. Mm. So they came from knowledge of drummers before them, which really were like Civil War drummers and, and rudimental, you know, drum corps kind of players. Yeah. So they had this incredible facility that they were learning, and they were inspired to play drums and learn their techniques and and uh, and just how these guys learned. And, but Gladstone played in New York City at Radio City, and he, he was a, 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 an avid performer and also doing some teaching. George Lawrence Stone, and Billy, of course, lived in New York City. George Lawrence Stone from the Boston area was working at all the vaudeville theaters and doing a lot of theater work and teaching. So he had his skill as a performer and as an educator. And Sanford Moeller was a drummer that was playing with John Philip Sousa's orchestra. Wow. Which was which was huge. That band was like, you know, powerful. And he was not only the you know in the snare drum line, he was the top snare drummer. And Philip Sousa, when he heard Moeller play many, many years ago, he said to him, I want you in my band because you know how to play loud and I need volume mm. with, my, with my full marching orchestra. So he said, listen, I want you to be – in my band, so he paid him a salary to be in the band, and he said, and any of the drummers that join my band have to go through your teaching school. Oh, wow. So, so he set Moeller up to teach, aside Jeez. from being in the band. So these guys had opportunities in the early 1900s as they you know, heightened their skills that this was the beginning of the drum set era. Exactly. I was going to say, that it's, 
it's just one of those a, a lot of times that happens where it's like the perfect storm of like the timing is there the drum set is being invented everything is changing absolutely and interesting too is remember all the immigrants that were coming from around the world to new york city this was where the energy was happening in new york so as they were all migrating here and you know as these immigrants from around the world when jazz started this music of freedom yeah these fantastic educators were the ones that guided this young talent for them to give us the legendary music that we guided our lives from. Hmm. So we have to always go back to the educator and how they're able to open up doors for this young generation. And that's pretty what these three guys did. Absolutely. Well, why don't we take them one by one here? So Billy Gladstone is someone I've seen a lot, um, in in various episodes, he's popped up as just being a obviously a performer, but he he worked with various different drum companies. Correct? Am I was he with Gretsch or am I mistaken on? Yes, that? he was. It was with Gretsch. Well, the early days, everybody was kind of with Gretsch. You know, sure. they, you know that was really the, the momentum of what it was. But Billy Gladstone also was a brilliant engineer, and he began mm. to manufacture his own snare drums. Yes. So he wanted he he came up with an idea, a patent that is still uh, under the Gladstone name of a snare drum where the lugs on the snare drum were manipulated where you can tune the bottom head from the top lug. So the top lug had like had like a little a little um uh drum key and then a bolt. So you had a, a drum key that when it went to the top part of the actual drum lug when you turned it it tightened the bottom head. Oh, when wow. you turned the key around, it slipped past that first top part and went to the bolt and tightened the top head. When you turn the key around, the key had three parts to it. It went and it connected to both of them, and you could tighten both heads at the same time. And this was a patent in the early 1920s. This guy was way ahead of the curve. Yeah, he, he kind of reminds me of George Way a little bit. Obviously, he was before that time, but it was uh, it's, it's just these inventive guys, so... That's Absolutely, and George Way was highly inspired by Billy Gladstone. The, mm. these, these guys were all from that era of real creative thinking at that early part of the 1900s. Remember, in the 1900s, you had Einstein, you had you know all these fantastic, you had Tesla, you had you know all these fantastic, you had Edison. All these great minds were coming out creatively, joining in, in the world, and they were all kind of based on the the East Coast in America. And it was just pretty in, intense to see all these ideas that came out of it. It's pretty, pretty magical. Yeah, really. Now, so uh, he was a performer, as you said. Now, didn't he play at Radio City Music Hall? Is that right? He did. It was Radio City Music Hall and several of the theaters that were there, you know, Carnegie Hall and all those early days. And there was another percussionist that was uh, that was performing who played mallets. Gladstone played snare drum. And the mallet player was Shelley Mann's father. Oh, wow. So Shelley Mann, the great drummer, literally as a kid, was hanging out with Billy Gladstone and learned Gladstone's techniques to such a high level, which was mostly finger technique okay, and a high level of sensitivity. And and I came to hear about these names. It was kind of funny. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, this story. I was 18 years old, and because of where I live on Long Island, I was close enough to New York City where it was just a quick 15-minute train ride or a car drive to go into New York City. So in the late 60s and early 70s, I went into New York all the time and heard all the greatest drummers of the world. Everybody was here in New York. You know, with Buddy, you know, Buddy Rich, Louis Belston, Art Blakey, Max Roach, you know, Philly Joe Jones, Papa Joe Jones. It, it just everybody was here. Elvin, everybody was here performing. So every night was a different drummer. And I went to a concert at a club where Max Roach was playing. And he had his own band that he put together. Hmm. And it was like it was like a Tuesday night. And I kind of walk in there. And it's 1971. I'm 18 years old. And I walk in and I hear Max play. And he played four sets that just absolutely blew me away. The intensity, the passion. And here was a man that already had some gray on his face and on his beard, his hair. And, you know, when you're 18 years old and you see somebody with a little gray in their hair, you know, you, you think the guy's got like one foot in the grave, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, man, this guy's not going to even make it through the evening. Yeah. Well, I looked at Max Roach and he blew me away with his ease of facility, his relaxed approach, his creativity. At every set that he played, out of the four sets, every solo was completely different. Mm. So, I, so at the end of the performance, everyone had left the club and I sat there a little bit stunned and in shock. I said, boy, here I am working on this instrument. I'm studying with a great teacher, Al Miller on Long Island. I'm trying to get this, my act together. This guy blew me away. So I walk up to the stage and I said, excuse me, Mr. Roach, can I shake your hand and ask you a couple questions? 
And he leans down and goes, absolutely. So he shakes my hand. He says, are you a drummer? I said, yes, sir. He goes, you take any lessons? I said, yes, sir, with Al Miller. And Max said, oh, I know Al Miller from Long Island. You tell him I said hello. I have his books that, I'm, that, that I look through. Hmm. Wow. So already I felt like, boy, this guy immediately just welcomed me. Immediately. And he goes, I said, can I ask you a question? How, how do you have that kind of freedom that you can just sit down, play what you feel, and just express yourself like any language? It just, you feel you, your brain takes it in and you express it with no challenges or barriers at all. How the heck do you get to that stage? And he looks at me and says, come up on the stage with me. So I hop up on the stage and he leans over to me and he puts out three fingers on his left hand. And I remember how he did it. He showed his pinky, his ring finger, and his middle finger. And he puts it in front of me and says, three names. And he points to his pinky and says, Billy Gladstone. Goes to the next finger and says, George Lawrence Stone. And goes to the next finger and says, Sanford Moeller. Mm. He said, those movements are going to give you this freedom. Boy. So I, I, I looked. I said, my gosh. I said, these are three teachers. And I had kind of known Moeller because Jim Chapin, I had heard as a kid, lived on Long Island. He was a student of Mola, but I really didn't understand the Mola technique. Yeah. I knew George Lawrence Stone because of his book, Stick Control, which is which is just a, a classic, and his book, Accents and Rebounds. Although I hadn't been through the books, but I knew of the books. And then Gladstone, I had heard his name in the New York area from different people that had known of him. So I, I kind of heard that, but I said, I said, wow. I said, Mr. Roach, I, I, I want to study with these guys. If these are the guys, he said, they taught everybody. They taught me, Papa Joe Jones, Philly Joe Jones, Art Blakey, Buddy Rich. All these guys learned from those guys. I said, my gosh, I got to learn from these guys. And Max leans over to me and says, too late. They're dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. And, but their books and, live on. That's the truth. Well, that you know. Absolutely. So, so when he said that, I was kind of shocked. I said, oh, man. So my next question is what really impressed Max that developed our friendship? I said, Mr. Roach, if they're gone, who were their best students? And that's when he said, I like you. Good said, question. Help, yeah. help me pack up my drums and we'll talk some more. So now I'm on the stage helping Max Roach pack up his drums. I mean, it, it, in that itself is, is, is a whole nother story. But yeah. in that point, you know, it, it led me to Shelly Mann was the best student of Billy Gladstone. Joe Morello was the best student of George Lawrence Stone. And Jim Chapin was the best student of Sanford Augustus Mola. It's a good list. That's where I went. So he said to me, he said, start with Morello, get the stone technique down first, because once you have the stone technique, which is this free stroke and rebound, and once you understand that and that strengthens your wrists, then understand molar. That'll help you understand molar better. Once you get the molar technique down and understand that, then study with Shelly Mann and get the Gladstone technique down. So that was the, that was the direction he gave me. Stone first, molar next, then Gladstone. So I said, Great. In, in my, you know, naivety, I said, okay. So I ended up literally in the next week meeting Morello backstage at a Buddy Rich concert. Man. So here I am, <laughs> I'm 18 years old. And it turns out that my teacher, Al Miller, was a, um, was it just, he was here on Long Island, a brilliant man. He, he's gone now for 20 years and he has some books out that are just fantastic books that are still great, great books. And he um, had pictures of Buddy Rich in a studio. So one day he said to me, he goes, uh, he goes, Dom, he goes, listen, I got a, a buddy friend of mine coming over tomorrow. Why don't you come over for dinner and we're going to have dinner with this buddy friend of mine. So I said, wow. I said, Mr. Mill, thanks so much. He said, yeah, come on by. So as I'm, uh, I'm getting ready, the next day I come by and as I'm driving to his house, I pass a club. It was called, it was called you know, Poor Peter's. It was a wonderful jazz club that was literally two blocks from Al's house. So when I'm passing it, I see in the marquee, it says tonight, the Buddy Rich Big Band. So I said, Oh man, how cool is this? Buddy Rich Big Ben is playing tonight. I'm going to go have dinner with Al. So I go to the club and I buy three tickets front row center. One for me, one for my teacher Al, and one for his buddy friend. Mm. I put my tickets in my pocket. I am pumped up. So now I go to this dinner at Al's house. So I knock on the door and Al answers the door and I said, Al, have I got a surprise for you? He says, well, that's fantastic. Come on in. I've got a surprise for you too. I walk in the house. I turn to his living room, and there is Buddy Rich. Oh, man. 
Now, understand now, at this point in 1971, Buddy Rich was just, he was always on the Johnny Carson show, which yeah. was every night. He was performing with his band everywhere. This guy was at the peak of his game playing with Sinatra, Sammy Davis. This guy was in Vegas. This guy was everywhere. And now he's in my drum teacher's house in suburbia, Long Island. Man. So I, I, so Al says, Buddy, I want you to meet my student, Dom Familiar. And Dom, this is, this is Buddy Rich. So I lean over to shake Buddy's hand. As I'm shaking his hand, I turn to Al Miller and I said, Al, you said I was going to meet a Buddy friend of yours. This is not a Buddy. <laughs> That's this the is buddy. the Buddy. That's a big freaking <laughs> difference, I said. <laughs> well, we oh. laughed. Buddy loved that. And, and then Al cooked some steaks and we had Caesar salad and some wine and we sat down talking. And, and I just, you know, remember what my mom said. You have two ears and one mouth. Listen twice as much as you <laughs> oh, speak. <laughs> very true. How was he? Was he, I mean... He was down yeah. to earth. He was funny, and he was a vaudevillian. Yep, a, a vaudevillian is a person that, as an entertainer, you know, Buddy was on stage at the age of two. Absolutely. He was the breadwinner in the family, so Buddy was already a song and dance man. He danced, he sang, he played drums, he told jokes. He, he was a, a juggler. This guy, this guy did everything, and he grew up with that skill. So. He was just the nicest guy, loving and welcoming. He was nothing near of some of the stories that have been, been you know, the rumors that have been passed down on, on who he was. Was he intense? Absolutely. Yeah. Was he driven to be the best performer he can be every night? Absolutely. Did he drive his band to be the best they can be? Absolutely, because he wanted to give the best performance to every audience because he figured if this was my last performance, I need to make this the best. That yeah. was his personal constitution. Yeah. That's heavy. So now we're eating and then it's about, you know, seven o'clock, seven 30. And buddy says, oh, he looks at his watch and he goes, okay, guys, we got to go to the gig. Let's go. Come on. We'll, we'll, we'll leave in a couple minutes. We'll, we'll take my car. So I'm remembering the gig. <laughs> the guy's playing tonight. <laughs> I forgot about the tickets that I bought. Three tickets front row center. So we come outside and Buddy goes, come on, we'll take my car. And he's had a red Corvette Stingray. <laughs> and he turns to me and he says, Dom, you hop in the back seat. Now, Whoa. if you know a red Corvette Stingray, Bart, there is no freaking back seat. <laughs> yeah. It's where you put your attache case, you know? Yeah. So I climb in behind these seats. I get in the car. Al gets in the passenger seat. We, Buddy starts driving and he drove very quickly. We're driving. And as he's driving... I said, I said, buddy, I had no idea I was meeting you. I bought three tickets to go hear the band tonight. So buddy turns to me and he says, well, how stupid is that? You're going to sit backstage with Al. Give me the tickets. <laughs> wow. So I pass the tickets up to the front of the car. Buddy grabs these three tickets. We pull up into the front of poor Peter's. There's a lineup of people buying tickets. Buddy gets out of the car with my three tickets, walks to the last three people in line, gives them my tickets and says, I'll see you front row center. <laughs> he turns around gets back in the car the people are in shock he gets back in the car we drive around to the back of the club we go in the back door buddy then grabs two folding chairs puts them backstage behind the curtain al and i sit down and buddy says i'll catch you guys after the show i'll drive you home <laughs> and walks away <laughs> so I, I i'm in i'm in i'm beyond shock it's beyond surreal i'm in like what the freak is going on here so i turned to al who's sitting next to me i said al how the hell do you know this guy <laughs> so al turns to me and says we spent two years together in world war ii he said i was a martial arts instructor and buddy was a martial arts instructor so yeah. they paired us together in world war ii in the marines and they just happened to be both from new york and both drummers so he said so we bonded a friendship by being in the marines together that's how it started so <sighs> Every concert that Buddy would come into the East Coast, he would call his friend Al. And Al, because I became one of Al's top students, Al would always call me up and take me along the way. So I was backstage at a Buddy concert all the time. Now, why this is yeah. important is because backstage at a Buddy concert, you meet all the best drummers. And that's where I met Morello. So I'm sitting down in a chair and with Al at a concert. I'm not even sure. I think it was a, a club called Jupiter's in Franklin Square, Long Island. And Buddy called us up and we're sitting backstage. And there was another chair next to me. And in comes walking Joe Morello with his dog, Matthew. Joe was legally blind, so he had this seeing eye dog. He comes in with this dog, Matthew. And he says to my right, Al Miller, my teacher, is to my left. 
And Buddy saw us and waved, and, and, waved and, and it was just so, so great on how respectful he was to, to Al and Morello, too. And, and me, I was this young 18-year-old kid. I was nothing, but he was absolutely respectful to me. And he mm. kind of saw me as, you know, a, a student in the next generation. Yeah. So he goes on and he performed that night, and he played a, a, a drum solo that was so incredible in the first set. On his snare drum, he played like about a 15-minute solo on just his snare drum. And 2,000 people in the audience, he was able to bring 2,000 people to their feet in the middle of his solo just playing a snare drum. Mm. Now, listen, you know, today now you have double bass and you got cymbals you're crashing. You can get a crowd riled up because we're doing all this. This guy had a snare drum. He, he didn't use the other parts of his drum. He just used the snare drum in the solo, brought the people to their feet, brought the band back in, came in back with the band, and the place went absolutely crazy. He says, I'll see you second set, and he walks off. So I now, I, I'm holding my head in my hands at this time. So he just played this incredible solo on the snare drum, and I turned and I said, guys, to Al Miller and Merlo, what the hell did this guy just do on that snare drum? So my teacher, Al Miller, said, I have no idea what this guy just did. <laughs> Morello crosses his arms and turns to me and says, he played a series of low strokes, half strokes, and full strokes using Gladstone, Stone, and Molar movement, playing pullouts and control strokes. So I start laughing. So Morello says to me, why are you laughing? I said, well, Mr. Morello, what you said just sounded so academic. It was just kind of funny. He said, well, that's what he did. So Bart, I said, okay, wait a second. Tell me that again. So when he explained it again and mentioned the Gladstone, Stone, and Molar movements, then I knew I was on to something. Yeah. So my teacher, Al Miller, said, listen, you've been with me now for several years. Maybe it's time now to take some lesson with Joe. So I get Joe's number of the store he was teaching at. That was a Sunday night. Monday morning, I call the store. Tuesday, I'm in a lesson with Morello in New Jersey. Hmm. And I said, Mr. Morello, I said, I, I just want to learn all the stuff that you told me that buddy did. I just want to understand what the hell that is. So that began yeah. the journey of now Joe then started me with George Lawrence Stone's free stroke, this 100% rebound stroke that when you throw the stick down, you allow the stick to rebound into your hand. So you're not really controlling the stick. You're only guiding the stick. Gotcha. And that's, that was, that's his technique, right? That, is the that, free stroke. That's, that's the that stone technique. George Lawrence Stone's technique, the free stroke where you throw the stick down and let it bounce back. See, Got many it. of the drummers before Stone were holding the stick tight in the hand. They yeah. would throw the stick down and they would pull it up and they were controlling the stick and they were hurting their hands. They were getting pain. They were not able to play for a long period of time. So Stone kind of realized that if, if I allow rebound to be a part of me, the physics of movement, and, and it goes back to, again, the minds of, of Isaac Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. If I throw it down and allow myself to relax and let the stick bounce up, I'm using the least amount of energy for the maximum amount of results. Pause for a sec. Let me ask you, though, real quick, backing up. Was Buddy a student of these techniques or because... Joe Morello could just call it out and say this is what he was doing, or was Buddy, like we all kind of know, was from another planet and just sort of pulled all these different techniques uh, just by his nature of being a great drummer, or did he actually study these? Bart, great question, great question. And I asked Buddy this, and I got the answer. Because Buddy was was highly skilled with yeah. finger, his finger move, which is Gladstone, this wrist rebound, and molar. So Buddy t told me when he was a young child, in his early days of vaudeville, he was the opening act of George M. Cohan. Now, have you ever heard that name, George M. Cohan? I don't think so. Do the research, and anybody, anybody hearing my voice, do the research on who George M. Cohan was. George M. Cohan was a song and dance band back in the, in the early 1900s, and he was the guy that, that wrote many songs, and he was the one that really started Broadway. The whole concept of Broadway in New York, of having the theater district, was George M. Cohan. When you go to Times Square, Right at the beginning of the Broadway Theater District is a huge statue of George M. Cohan, mm. who they called Mr. Broadway. Wow. 
he wrote songs. He wrote songs like um, "Her Name Was Mary, Mary." Da, 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 da. This was a huge pop yeah, song sure. back in the early 1900s. He also wrote during World War One the uh, the marching song that that fired up the troops over here, yeah, over yeah. there, and the gangs all coming. That was all George M. Cohan. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This guy helped with World War I, firing up the soldiers with his songs. This guy was deep, and he was a song and dance band. So he had several Broadway shows going on with these theater districts. Buddy Rich was the opening act for George M. Cohan. Hmm. Now, as the opening act, Buddy would go out, play the drums, tap dance, sing a song. He was the opening act, and George M. Cohan toured all throughout the U.S., doing these shows. George M. Cohan used, whenever he was traveling, the best musicians in his band. He would carry around his first trumpet player, his first violinist, his arranger, his piano player, and his drummer. The drummers that George M. Cohan used were either Billy Gladstone, George Lawrence Stone, or <laughs> Sanford Moeller. Jeez. These are the guys that, <laughs> that, were, that were playing behind George M. Cohan. So Buddy is sitting in the pit watching these three these three great drummers perform at different times and if they traveled in a train to go from new york to chicago buddy was next to them sitting with them not formally taking lessons yeah sure but learning the gladstone stone and molar movements mm, buddy told me he says i got them from those guys so if you can imagine when i talked to papa joe jones and took i took a couple of lessons with papa joe jones he would tell me at certain times, he goes, over here now, here's where you want to accent so you use molar. Uh, this particular pattern you're going to play from your wrist, so use stone. Now here, this is more sensitive and a little quicker passage. Go to French grip position and use your fingers. Use Gladstone. So that, they would, that, that was the terminology that they, they, they used normally. Yeah. What they didn't do, they didn't notate this stuff in books to carry it on for the next generation. Well, yeah, that's a good point. I mean... It seems like it's it's still very popular to use these techniques, but like you said, it's it's it seems like back then it was like your everyday language. I mean, you're just you're, this is how you explain what you're doing when you're talking to other drummers, which I guess doesn't happen quite as much as it did. The molar technique you hear about a lot, but um, well, yeah. it, it it totally it totally was that everyone knew these techniques. They talked about it, and it was never logged down in books or or to the technology that we have today. So here I am now, I'm I'm you know years have gone by. It's the it's the you know middle eighties and I'm traveling now. I'm in, I'm endorsed with companies traveling around the world doing these different drum clinics and performances around the world. So I had studied with Morello and Chapin. Now I'm utilizing these techniques and I also studied with Shelly Mann. After Morello, when I had learned the technique to a certain point, he said, now you're ready for Jim Chapin. So he sent me to Chapin to now go from the stone technique to molar. So in the process was, as I was traveling around, around the world, I'm talking about, in my clinics, free stroke, molar, and Gladstone. And I'm traveling to all these different countries. People are looking at me like I got three freaking eyeballs. <laughs> what the hell is molar? What, what, what are you talking about? So because of where I lived on Long Island, we knew about this stuff. Outside of the Long Island, New York area, no one knew about this stuff. Yeah. Nevertheless, me traveling to different countries. Oh, sure. So now I, what I would do is uh, when I came back from my travels in, in the early 90s, when I came back, a, a, my, the success of my career in traveling and playing and being involved with endorsing all these companies, it's just fantastic. What I would do is when I come back, I would invite Jim Chapin and Morello to dinner. And once a month when I came back, I'd pick up Jim Chapin at his house, drive over to Morello, find a nice restaurant, and we'd have dinner. And I'd buy these guys dinner. If, for the hundred or the hundred and fifty dollars that I would spend for dinner for all three of us, it was the, the, one of the best investments I've ever made in my life because the stories and the anecdotes and the history was incredible. And one day we're at dinner and we're sitting down, and I said to Morello, I said, "Jay, I said, Joe, you wrote two great books, Master Studies One and Master Studies Two, fantastic books that are so deep, but you never mentioned the free stroke in there. But yet when I worked with you for almost eight years, all we did was the free stroke." Hmm. And I said to Jim Chapin, I said, Jim, you wrote your book, Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer, one of the top, still the number one drum set book in the world. And you said that because of learning the Moeller technique, that that's what helped you to write your independence book in jazz. Why didn't you ever talk about Moeller in the book? And I said to Joe, why didn't you ever talk about the free stroke in the book? And they both turned to me at the same time and said, oh, everyone knows this stuff. You no, know, I think not. <laughs> and that's exactly what I said. I said, oh, I think not. I said, because 
I'm traveling the world and no one knows about it. So they both kind of sat back in their seats and kind of got a little somber. And I said, well, then this stuff needs to be notated. I said, yeah, guys, you guys got to write this stuff down and put this into it. And they both said to me, wrong. We're in our late 70s. We're done writing books. It's now your turn in your generation to do this here. You write the book. You know the stuff, so you write it. So that's when I wrote my book, It's Your Move. This book is 26 years old. I wrote the book, It's Your Move, simply because it was about explaining the free stroke and molar. And I say in that book, I'm not showing you techniques that Dom Famulara created. I'm just trying to be the messenger to pass on what I learned from Jim Chapin, who got from Moeller, that I learned from Morello, who got from Stone. So that was yeah. the beginning part of the first book that was notated to be able to have the information put into the, into the you know, the, the, at least the, 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 the lexicon of the educational material for drummers. To make sure they don't disappear forever. That's all it was. And then from that, when I ended up showing this stuff to, to um, Jojo Mayer, yeah, that he then put together the DVD, The Secret Weapons of a Modern Drummer, which he explained the techniques in, in now DVD and, and video format. So we further have the stuff now explained and done, and I've done you know, hundreds of different uh, you know, stuff on YouTube and videos that I've done to explain it. So I think we have enough of this information that is out there, but people have to really realize you got to go to the sources that really have the validity of the techniques. Mm. You know, yeah, when, really. I, when I when I studied with Chapin, I'll never forget that one of the first lessons that I came in with Chapin. He said, um, "I'm going to tell you a story that Moeller told me, and I want you to tell the story to every student that you show this technique to." We didn't touch a stick or a pad or anything. I said, "Okay." So he sits me down and he tells me the story. He said, "When Moeller was young, when he was like 13, 14 years old, this is now in like you know 18, 1894. Where do you go to take lessons, drum lessons, in 1894?" There were no schools. There were no, no private. Yeah. He said, so where do you go? You go to the old soldiers' homes where all the retired drummers from the Civil War are, are there that played all their life playing drums, and you go and you take lessons from them. So that's where Moeller went. He learned from Civil War drummers. He lived in Albany, and in Albany is where one of the first um, soldiers, the old soldiers' homes was built in the capital of New York after the Civil War. So Moeller, who happened to be from Albany, was able to find one of these old soldiers' homes and goes there and studies from a couple of drummers at these homes, learning these techniques. And Mola said to Chapin, which is what Chapin wanted the story to be carried on, is that when Mola came in with his drum, he sat down, he sat in front of his drum, and then a door would open up down the hallway, and an elderly man in his late 80s and early 90s would walk down the hall, and as he was walking down the hall towards Mola, he was leaning on the rail and leaning on furniture when he was walking, kind of dragging his feet. This man walked up, sat next to Moeller, grabbed a pair of sticks, and then on the drum, started to play incredibly well. Hmm. So Moeller said, I, an old man walked out to give me a lesson. A young man gave me a lesson. And then when the lesson was over, an old man walked back to his room. Oh, that's cool. Wow. So what Moeller realized is these old guys who could barely walk were playing this big stroke, this big arced whip stroke, and playing powerful and fast, and they were freaking old. <laughs> so, so Moeller, yeah. Moeller would like, as a kid, would look at it and say, these guys, they're walking to me. I I'm afraid these guys are going to die on me in this lesson, nevertheless play drums. And then when they played, they blew Moeller away. So that's kind of what got Moeller into this holy macro. Something's going on here. So Moeller didn't invent the stroke. He just understood as a kid the correlation between that arm and whip motion and the speed and power that you can have. So Chapin, in 1938, takes lessons from Moeller. And Chapin's story was, as he told me, is that Chapin, in 1938, went to the Metropole, which was a famous jazz club in New York that all these, these bands played. And he goes there with his girlfriend at 18 years old, and he hears Gene Krupa play with his band. Chapin had never played drums. He was an, he's at a very, very high IQ, very, very smart guy, well-read. And he walks in and he hears Krupa's band play and he's blown away by Krupa playing. Absolutely blown away. After the show's over, Krupa comes down to talk to the people. Now imagine Gene Krupa, this incredible movie star, you know, good-looking, handsome, 1938. Yeah. He's at the peak of his game in several movies. The guy, it, it's incredible. Comes down and talks to the people. How, how great is that? Such a nice guy. Yeah. Totally. So he, he meets Jim Chapin and Jim says to Krupa, he says, Mr. Krupa, you inspire me. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want you to be my teacher. 
Now, the guts that it took for <laughs> Chapin to say to the greatest drummer yeah. on the planet, listen, you're the best. I want you to be my teacher. Really was, I thought, comical in its way. And Gene, very polite, said, boy, thank you for that compliment. He said, I'm so busy performing. I'm not teaching, but I'm going to give you the number of my teacher, Sanford Augustus Moeller. Oh, my God. That's unbelievable. He, he writes down Moeller's name and writes down his number on a napkin, gives it to Chapin, and Chapin goes, great. He was your teacher. He's good enough for me. The next day, Chapin calls up Moeller and starts lessons for about two and a half years with Moeller, going two or three times a week. Moeller was in Queens, Long Island teaching. Jim's mother had lived in the Queens area of where it was, so he was close enough to Moeller. Mola now, you know, is is semi retired from from playing with John Philip Sousa. He's got all these top students, and all the great drummers in New York are studying with Moeller, as they are also with Billy Gladstone. So after Moeller, the guys would go to him, and then Moeller would say, "Listen, when you went to a lesson with Moeller, do you know the free stroke? If you didn't know the free stroke, Moeller would say, "I want you to go to Stone, learn the free stroke, and I'll see you in a year." Because Moeller realized if you understood the free stroke, it was easier to show the Moeller movement. So that was part of the process. So Chapin went to Stone, got some lessons from Stone, goes into Moeller, takes some lessons with Moeller, and learns Moeller's technique to become the best of the best of teaching this technique. Hmm. Moeller passes, passes away in, in the mid-60s. And at one point, Gene Krupa wanted to relearn. Back in the, in the late 50s, Gene Krupa wanted to learn and go back to school again. So he contacts Moeller and says, Mr. Moeller, I want to come back. I'm, I'm, I'm based in New York again. I want to come back and I want to study your technique. I want to get back into learning again. And meanwhile, Krupa had already been a famous celebrity. Gene had performed with his band in over 100 movies. If anyone goes and just types Gene Krupa in movies, you can't believe how many times he performed in movies. In incredible. Incredible. Yeah. So he contacts Moeller and Moeller says, boy, that's fantastic, Gene, that you want to continue learning. Uh, I, that's such a good part. He said, but I'm not teaching anymore. I recommend all of my students to Jim Chapin. If you want to learn my technique, call Jim. So now Krupa calls up Chapin. So Chapin said, as Jim's telling me the story, I said, Jim, you got to be kidding. What happened when he called? He said, oh, when he called up and said it was Gene Krupa, I hung up on him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Hang up. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what do you mean you hung up on him? I just hung up on him. I thought it was a joke. I said, what happened? He said, he called me back. And when he called me back, he said, don't hang up. I got your number from Sanford Moeller. I want lessons. And then for that, for a couple year period, Jim brought back Gene to understand this techniques. And Jim taught Gene this technique that went full circle. God, they're all so connected. I feel like right now I need in front of me like, a giant board that has pictures, that has arrows. That has I I got it for you. When you uh -oh. go to my when you go to my website, go to my website, and on my website you can download the image of what I call the drum teacher lineage. Website domfamiliar.com. It's free. Go there and look for the drum teacher lineage. It's on the download. Download the document because I did that document. On the top, it's got Gladstone, Stone, and Moeller. It's got the books that they were known for, the year that they were born and they died. And then under that, their students. See, under Gladstone was Ted Reed, who wrote the book Syncopation, yeah. was Shelley Mann, because Shelley studied with him the most out of anybody, was Henry Adler, and also was, also was uh, Arnie Lang. Mm. Arnie Lang is still alive and kicking it to this day. I'm sure he's in his late 80s, and he's probably the last living student of Billy Gladstone. And I had the chance of sitting down with all of those guys to understand Gladstone. So after I studied with Chapin, which was here in Long Island, he said, okay, you're ready for Shelly Mann. So I said, great. At that time, Shelly Mann had moved to California. He was doing the movie scores out there and TV shows and playing with his, with his bands out there. So I packed up a band, a keyboard player and a bass player from New York. I said, guys, how about we go play in California? They said, boy, great idea. So in 1976, I, I purchased a van and we drove to California 3,000 miles so I could take lessons with Shelly Van. <laughs> wow. Man, you had a quite the journey there. And and I want to I want to pause and say I did not know that was on your website. That's hysterical that you actually have that. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And and I did I did that Bart because I realized that I said that I had to start logging this down because now I, when, when I teach someone and I've got many students that come to me, I've got over twenty five hundred students that travel with me from over thirty countries, and, I, and and I'm blessed and honored to be able to share this information with all of them. Yeah. And, and when they come by here, 
I had to give them a part of this lineage because I want them to understand that every one of my students is a part of a bigger, a bigger scene. You're a part now of a lineage that when totally. I show them the stone stuff and we go through stick control and accents and rebounds, it's just so deep. And I've had the chance to work with the family. If you can get a, you know, a, a new version of stick control and accents and rebounds, my name is in, in those books because I helped the grandchildren. You know, George Lawrence Stone died in the mid-60s. Uh, his, uh, his five children died before the year 2000. And now I'm working with his grandchildren in all of his material. And they are wonderful people. And we have reissued Stick Control, where we've added quotes, the inside cover of, these, uh, of Stick Control. And we re-engraved the book so it looks cleaner. We changed nothing. Mm. And, and the yeah. family put a wonderful quote in there of a thank you to me with, with my website in the, in, in, the, in the book. And then we also redid Accents and Rebounds, which was Stone's second book. And then I asked John Riley, um, Danny Gottlieb, and Steve Foster, three um, other drummers that were studying with Morello at the time I was there, to write comments in the beginning of Accents and Rebounds. So when you get the new version of Accents and Rebounds, you'll see the, 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 the explanation of how the book is to be played. Remember, none of this stuff was explained in the books. Yeah, so when really. I finally had a chance to work with the family, I said, listen, I want to explain what I know was your grandfather's way of teaching in the book so we don't lose this. So we did that with Accents and Rebounds. And it was just fantastic to have the book out now. And the books are selling even more than they've ever sold before because the young generation now has the clarity of the information to go through this stuff. Yeah, that's known. I mean, so I'm working, I have a seven month old baby, but I'm working my way slowly through stick control right now, which I never did. I took lessons when I was younger and then I just took time off and just played in bands a lot and then got into audio engineering. And now I'm going back with a pad and working through stick control. And I've, I've heard from multiple people that stick control is one thing when you're alone. And it's a completely different thing when you have someone to tell you how to use it properly. And, right. and also you can just take stick control, put it on your feet, Put it, you know, split it up. You can do so many different things with page one. So it's, Absol it's unbelievable. Absolutely, Bart. And here's, here's what I tell people. And, and first of all, with your engineering and your drumming background, you need, and I'll give you his information, you need to contact David Frangioni and interview him because not only is he a fantastic drummer, he's also taking lessons with me and he's working, we're working on exactly this Gladstone, Stone, and Molar approach. And his, his playing is just fantastic. Oh, but he great. also is an incredible audio engineer of what he does. So he's got the balance of what you're doing in both his figures. And with stick control, absolutely. If you go through, it starts on page five. If you go through the book, playing the free stroke, which is this rebound stroke, playing the free stroke on every number. And if you played each number one minute, each page becomes a 24-minute exercise. And you go from number one to number two, playing this rebound free stroke. And as you play this rebound free stroke, what's amazing about it is you start to feel the relaxation that happens in your hands, which is what Stone wanted, which is how I went through the book with Morello and how he taught many of his students years ago. And then from that, from stick control, then when you go into accents and rebounds and you learn about how to play accents and pull out some control strokes and up, up strokes and down strokes within that motion, that also not only helps your fluidity on the drum set, but as I did back in the mid seventies, after I went through stick control with my with my teacher Morello, I said, "Joe, how would this book work with our feet?" And Joe said, "Well, oh, yeah. we've never done that, but try it out." So I went through the book, one page a week, one minute each exercise with my hands, and then did the exact same routine with my feet. <laughs> to great result, I'm sure. I mean, of course, it's going to make you stronger and better, and and translate. Absolutely. You know, I I just played a a uh, about six months ago. It was posted. I, I played a track, "Eye of the Tiger." That's on uh, Drumeo YouTube channel. Yeah, loved it. And, and what I got a kick out of it, it's it's only been out now for about six or seven months, but it already has like a, you know, almost two million views. And and on there, here I am at sixty six years young, playing, <laughs> and all the young comments about this guy's feet are incredible, double bass. This guy should be playing metal. When I hear all that stuff, I get a kick out of it. And that all came from the free stroke applied to my feet using Stone's book. Stick control and accents and rebounds. That's so funny. From a guy born in the late 1800s, it's just <laughs> it's amazing, unbelievable. Right? And, and on, on, on top of the next level, I got to tell you about this here. So the I've been working with the Stone family many years ago when I was when I was younger in the late 60s. I saw some articles in a magazine. It was called the International Musician Magazine, and it was it was it was a magazine. It was kind of like it, it was it was like a newspaper, and it came out like every week, and it had in there a feature of George Lawrence Stone writing articles about drumming in this, in this magazine. 
And he wrote in there from 1946 to 1963. He died a few years after. So I remember all of those different articles. I had no idea where they were. So in my contact with the family, which are just the Stone family, they are just such wonderful people. I had mentioned, I said, listen, guys, there were some articles that Stone, you know, your grandfather wrote. Can you track down these articles? I think they'd be great to read. So the family went and took several years. We tracked down every article, and they put a book together that is just released now on Alfred Publications called Technique of Percussion, columns by George Lawrence Stone for the International Music Musician Magazine from 1946 to 1963. It's about two inches thick, the book, and it's all the the articles that George Lawrence Stone wrote. This is huge. And in there, Stone talks about Gladstone. He talks about Moeller. He talks about Chapin and Morello and and, and all these different lessons that he taught. He talked about all of his students, Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich. This book is historically so important to read. And I tell everyone, go get Technique of Percussion on Alfred Publications and read the historical insight because going through this book, it validates everything that I teach. What a prolific guy. I mean, and and that actually leads me to that. So we talked about... Billy Gladstone's background, obviously, Radio City Music Hall, inventor, snare drum. Uh, we talked about Sanford Moeller, learning from Civil War drummers, growing his technique from there. What about George Lawrence Stone as a man a little bit more? You said he was in Boston. What, what else? What, what got him you know, going? Uh, when you get the new version of Stick Control, which, is, which has the quotes in the, in the inside cover, I asked the family to put together a page of history. And there's a page of history in the new version of Stick Control that explains this. These guys like Stone grew up in a drum manufacturing atmosphere where they were not only making drums, but they were playing drums and teaching drums. Yeah. And that's kind of like also the influence that Gladstone had. Gladstone kind of was influenced by that. And when George Lawrence Stone would make marching drums, Gladstone wanted to make more contemporary snare drums. So he came up with his drums. And And Billy Gladstone only made about 40 or 50 snare drums. And these snare drums probably sell for forty to $50,000 each. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, that's it, it's, it's as incredible. rare as it gets. And, and the George Lawrence Stone snare drums, the same thing. They are just wonderfully hand-constructed and made. So, so George Stone learns from his father. And then again, at that time in the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, is when Vaudeville, when the theater district opened up. So in the theater district, there were all these acts that were performing. They needed musicians. So George Lawrence Stone could read very well. He could play not only snare drum, but he could play timpani and, and, and mallets. So he became the top performer in Boston that played all the theaters. And he became the top teacher. And he was the top drum manufacturer of rudimental drums. Wow. So he, he became like, he was like this stuff. And he married, had, had children and ran his business. And, uh, and, and, so, and then his book, came out in 1935. So he was working on these techniques back in the 1920s until he perfected it. And if you look at the old copies of Stick Control, the fact that the book came out in 1935 and looked as great as it looked, that book was was done by an engraver. What they used was a piece of metal and like a chisel and hammer, they chiseled into this metal the, each page for the book. And then that's how they, they ended up printing the book. They put this this metal you know, uh, you know, sheet and they, and they ran it around and they made book copies of it. Well, after about four or five years, the metal wore down and the negatives were no good. So the expense to do the book again was very difficult. So what they did after that from the 1940s on, they would just take a photograph of each page and print the book from the photograph. So the challenge with the book is the book started becoming blurry. And imagine doing that for like 50 years. Yeah. You know, so what happened was, so now it comes into the, so every time I get the book and I always say, go to, if you have an old, you know, stick control book, go to page 32 and on the bottom of the page, it was one of the worst pages. You see the blurry, you see like 30 second notes where there's three lines. You can't tell that there were three lines. You, you, you can't, the, the, the rests are all blurry. You can't mm. really, you, you can kind of figure out what it is, but it's kind of hard to see. So Every time I'd look at this book, I would look at it and say, my gosh, this book just looks ratty. It, it, it needs to be re-engraved. Well, the family contacts me at some point. They had heard that I was in the publishing business. They had heard that I was also a drummer and a top teacher, and that I was a student of Morello, and I was a student of Chapin, and a student of Shelley Mann, and they knew that was the connection from their grandfather. So they contacted me and said, we'd like you to help us out bringing this book into the 21st century. So they said to me, what would you change in stick control? 
And I said, boy, first of all, I am incredibly honored and humbled that you would even consider me to ask my advice, but I would change nothing. The only thing I would do is re-engrave the book. And then I said, it would be nice if we can put a note of history in there, a page of history about your grandfather and your great-grandfather. And I'd like to get quotes of famous drummers on the inside and back cover so we could have the influence of stick control with all these drummers. And they said, gee, we'll do that. So we found a good engraver. And then they said, well, gee, Dom, we don't know any drummers to ask them to ask for quotes of the book. <laughs> he said, don't worry about it. Yeah, you I got know that. them all. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome pretty amazing yeah man i mean it's so cool and you, like i i can just i can tell how honored you are to be a part of this lineage of this just again this more or less just a family tree of of teachers going down the line um yeah. and i don't even know why i didn't even put it together that the whole george b stone and son like the boston drums like the snare drums and everything it was, it was a family business and those drums if anybody goes on the internet and researches the even just some of the pictures of the drums they are beautifully handmade drums that sounded fantastic. That still sound good. Really incredible. Yeah. And there's something special about like drums made in Boston. I've talked about this with, I think, Rob Cook about how they had, they were just different. And, and that was the heritage of what we have in there. And also the, the, the Cooperman family, which, is a, which was in Boston, then moved to Vermont, were making the Cooperman drums that were kind of like the next generation of the George Lawrence Stone snare drums when, when Stone stopped making the drums. And Cooperman kind of took over. And Cooperman w was the one that made the snare drums from Moeller. So Moeller's drums okay. were all Cooperman drums. So any pictures you see of Moeller, you see him playing the Cooperman drums. And and uh, when when Sanford Moeller died, the Cooperman family contacted Jim Chapin and sent him one of Moeller's drums and said, we wanted you to have this here in honor of continuing in the Sanford Moeller way of how they play it. And uh, it was just so beautiful. And, and then when Jim Chapin passed away, knowing that I was one of his top students, the Cooperman company called me up and said, Dom, since Jim has passed away, since you are carrying the torch, we want to send you a Moeller drum. And I have a Moeller drum that they sent me that's in my studio that I have that I teach on. Wow. And it really is deep to have it. And, and it was it was a drum that Moeller had designed and, and, and played. And it's just really pretty valuable that uh, the lineage is not only in, in just the knowledge that we learned, but in the products that we're able to get a hold of. Those three guys, I feel like we have a good idea of them. Now, let me throw uh, kind of a curveball at you. And, and I wanted to... I've always heard his name and um, like in the, in the world of teachers, but Roy C. Knapp, I don't know much about him. Do you know, yeah. how was he involved with all this? I know he was kind of known as the Dean of American percussion teachers. Yeah. Roy, Roy Knapp was from Chicago and he was a drum core, uh, a drum core player. And he was a student of Sanford Moeller also. Oh, wow. And he also knew uh, George Lawrence Stone very well. They were, they were peers together. And whenever George Lawrence Stone would go to Chicago to perform with some of the some of the acts that he was performing with, they would get together and share ideas because they were more into the rudimental end. And but uh, Roy Knapp also knew Billy Gladstone. When Gladstone would travel, they would get together. So imagine these guys. Listen, Buddy Rich got together with Louis Belson and Elvin Jones and Max Roach, and they'd get together and they'd hang out and Morello and they'd share ideas. Th these guys, drummers, have a very very rare, you know, a DNA that we are willing to share ideas. Absolutely no. I mean, guitar players don't do this, bass players, drummers, yeah. they, they, you know, they, they will just share anything with you. And that's what they were like. So Roy Knapp was a phenomenal influencer in the Chicago area of what was happening and, and taught many, many students that went on to play drum set. You know, Barrett Deans, a, a very, Barrett Deans was a very, very famous drum set player that was also in several movies and a very, very fast player. He was a student of Roy Knapp. So this Roy Knapp had his own lineage. So if, if you were if you were to put together the bigger lineage, you've got Moeller, you know, Gladstone and Stone kind of teaching Roy Knapp, and then Roy Knapp was the next generation that from the Chicago area created his own lineage. Mm, yeah. Okay. And and there's some actual recordings on the internet of Roy Knapp playing, and just the precision and the accuracy that he played with was really deep and really exciting. Gosh, man, that's unbelievable. <laughs> it's so it's and and. As we wrap up, I just, I feel like it's, it's different now than you just, you might get on, not everyone does this, but you, you, you see where like, maybe you go to Sam Ash and you say, I want to take lessons and you get the teacher they give you. I mean, these guys are like, does it, it seems like you have to already be a drummer to get in with these guys at that point. You're like, I'm going to take it like Freddie Gruber or something like, I'm going to take it to the next level. 
um, like I'm Dave Weckl and I want to get better. Is that, or did they, did they teach guys who were, you know, this is my first day learning the drums. I'm a, you know, a 12 year old. Would you go to <laughs> like George Lawrence Stone and learn? Well, or they, is- it's funny you mentioned that because, um, uh, Vic Firth, who was a dear friend of mine, uh, for well over 40 years was a student of George Lawrence Stone at the age of 13. Oh, wow. Cool. So yes, these guys, if somebody was interested in, in, in learning drums, he took them in. So look what happened. You know, he teaches, you know, Vic Firth at a young age and, and Vic Firth turns into Vic Firth. He's Vic Firth. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So he goes on from there. But I mean, these guys were just absolutely phenomenal players. And, and, uh, you know, all of this information, what I'm doing is I'm working with Dave Frangioni, the new publisher of Bonham Drummer, as I had said, and, uh, they have recently uh, announced they want me to be worldwide education director for Modern Drummer. Great. And part of what this is, is I want people to, I want this information to start being put into Modern Drummer, but also into an educational program where each magazine has educational history and information and stuff to practice from this great lineage. Yeah. And, uh, and I tell everyone to go and subscribe to Modern Drummer and go to their website, subscribe to Modern Drummer, because now with uh, David Frangioni at the helm, there's going to be a whole new level of 21st century Modern Drummer information that's going to go out and pull from the past and lay the groundwork for the future of the 21st century. So it's very, very exciting. So subscribe and get involved. Yeah, that's extremely exciting. I, like many people, grew up on Modern Drummer and love it. And just by the name, you think it's all new stuff. But I just, there's so many articles of just great things. Like I remember learning about the painted drum heads, all these cool little things from reading Modern Drummer. Um, so I'm a huge fan. Congratulations to you on that. That's awesome. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, and I think that's a great segue as we uh, finish up here. Why don't you tell people what else you got going on, where they can find you, the sessions panel, all that good stuff. Oh, this is great. The sessions panel on YouTube, I ask everyone to go there and subscribe. It is, I've got over 200 interviews and I've got a phenomenal not-for-profit organization that is investing into trying to capture the stories of all these great musicians, not only drummers, but bass players, guitar players, and piano players. I've had the chance of sitting down to interview people like Steve Gadd, Vinnie Caliuta, Dave Weckl, Stuart Copeland, Steve Jordan. I mean, just, you know, I was able to interview some drummers that are no longer with us, Jabbo yeah. Starks and Clyde Stubblefield, the two great drummers from James Brown. I sat with them in a room together. We, the interview was fantastic. It was emotional. And within a few months after the interview, they both passed away. Oh. Boy. Hal Blaine. I interviewed Hal Blaine. What a great interview with Hal Blaine. This is the man that played all the soundtrack of the 1960s and 70s, and he played on thousands of recordings. He just passed away a year ago, and and just to hear his interview, when I sat down with him, I said, Jesus, I said, Hal, I'm from Long Island. When I started listening to music of the 60s and 70s growing up, I had like my top 10 favorite songs and drummers that I would listen to, that I would study. Little did I realize that you were nine out of those 10 drummers. <laughs> yeah, they're all him. Yeah. <laughs> Probably uncredited, obviously, like the Beach Boys and all this stuff. I mean, and that's Absolute, a whole, that's a whole episode the, right the there. The Beach Boys, Elvis, Sinatra. Yeah. I mean, just incredible. The Carpenters, all that fantastic music. So these interviews are important because we're capturing their story, especially before, hopefully catch you guys before they pass away. I had a chance to sit down with Roy Burns, the the, the, the great, great drummer who played with Benny Goodman for many years. Yeah. I had the chance of interviewing Ed Shaughnessy. We lost Ed also. So some of these guys that we've lost and, uh, and Indugu Chancellor who played with Billy, Billy Jean with Michael Jackson. We lost him a couple of years ago. So these interviews have been very, very important to capture the stories. Then I've sat down with not only great drummers, but bass players, Leland Sklar, Billy Sheehan, you know, Daryl Jones, who plays with the, the Rolling Stones. I've sat down with some phenomenal players, Nathan East, great bass player, guitar players, Steve Vai, what a great interview that was, piano mm. players, Chick Corea. I sat down with Chick Corea. You got to go so hear cool. that interview just to hear how great it was. And the questions I'm asking are not what it was like when you played with so-and-so. I'm not, I'm not, that doesn't, that doesn't impress me. What I want to know is, How'd you start? What yeah. books did you learn out of? What teachers did you have? How'd you practice? You know, you, what motivates you? Who are you listening to then? Who are you listening to now? What inspires you? When you hear these people speak about that, it is deep passion at its best. So that's going on with what it is. I'm still teaching out of my out of my studio at my home and that's going on fantastic. And I've been teaching using the internet for many, many years. So this is going on to global students around the world that I have. So I'm still traveling and it, I'm still at the thick of it. I feel great physically. I'm 66 years young and I have no plans of retiring. I don't use the R word for retire. I use the R word for reinvent. 
they say uh, you're not retiring, you're rewiring. You know, yeah, I, I, that's exactly <laughs> right. And I've got a publishing company called Wisdom Media that I that I've put together with a pheno- phenomenal partner, Joe Bergamini, who plays all the Broadway shows, and he's got several bands that he plays with. And we've got books out. HudsonMusic.com has the digital books. Alfred has the physical books. We've got more material coming out. There's more stuff happening. I'm at my desk pumping out stuff because I want the next generation to really understand historically what is there for them. And that's where I feel my responsibility is to do as Mm. much as I can for the next generation to be a part of this great lineage. God, you're no slouch. That's for sure. You're, (laughs) (laughs) you're always busy. Absolutely. Man, I am just blown away by, I, I, I just can't believe this. Just the, 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 like you can just follow the lineage of all these great drummers. And uh, I think it continues today. And um, I hopefully try to think that uh, in some way that what we're doing right now is passing on those stories to another generation and to people absolutely. who have like, I didn't know any of this. So um, absolutely. But, and, and what you're doing is great because this allows my voice to be heard. And hopefully in, in many, many years when I'm long gone, that when someone hears my voice as I'm speaking right now, they can sense the fact that, the information is still alive. Yeah. I might not be, but the information is still alive. Seek out the knowledge and be a part of a journey of playing art and playing music. I say art is about expression. Music happens to be my language, but drumming, that's my voice. Yeah. And that's really what it's all about. Beautifully said. Well, Dom, I really appreciate you being on the show. I will put all of your information uh, where people can find you, and I'll I'll link to that chart that you were talking about in the show notes as well, so people can check that out and uh, keep up with you and all that stuff. And and you can find Dom on Instagram at global number two Dom. Um, Lots of cool stuff there as well, in addition to the sessions panel and everything there. So, Dom, thank you for being on the show. This has just been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Bart, thanks so much. And thanks so much that you seek your responsibility to make this happen and touch base. There are so many more stories we can do. So we'll have to look for a part two at some point in the future. Fantastic. I love that. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. (laughs) Thanks so much. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.